so let's continue on in chapter one in bio 105. So uh, a little thing I skipped over was what biology is. Biology literally means the study of life. Bio means life and ology means study of it. And in this course, we're looking at two aspects of biology. One is anatomy and the other is physiology. Now, anatomy is a study of the structures of living organisms. So essentially what we're doing in anatomy is looking at what those parts are, right? What's the name of this bone? What's the name of this muscle? Stuff like that. The next part is physiology. And physiology is the study of the functions of living organisms. So we're gonna look at what those parts do and how they do it. So we're gonna spend time looking at the parts uh, and then we're gonna look at uh, some time on what those parts do and then also how they do it. So it, it, let's go back to physiology then is, you know, what do muscles do? Muscles contract. Uh, looking at how they contract, well, we're going to spend an entire day talking about how muscles contract. All right, now let's move on to the levels of organization. So when we look at levels of organization of an organism, uh, we're primarily looking at the human organism in this class. So we're going to start off with the smallest level of organization, and that's the atomic level. So an atom is the smallest particle of an element that retains the properties of that element. So an element are basic chemical substances, and you're probably familiar with like oxygen, hydrogen, nitrogen. Uh, those are different elements. And, ele uh, and atoms are made of smaller things, but if we take some of those smaller things away, then it loses uh, its function as that element. You can take a chemistry class to learn more about that. But if we take a couple of atoms together, we can make a molecule. So the next step is molecular level. So a molecule is a particle composed of two or more joined atoms. And so particles can, uh, and, sorry, a molecule can be something very small like water, which only has three atoms in it, uh, or it can be like DNA, which has lots and lots and lots of atoms in it. Now the next level of organization of an organism is the organelle level. And an organelle is a part of a cell that performs a specialized function. So over here, we're seeing a smooth muscle cell, and they're highlighting a couple of these organelles. One is the mitochondria. Mitochondria produce energy for the cell and the nucleus, and the nucleus houses our genetic material. So in a way, it's our control center of our cell. So above the organelle level is the cellular level. And the cellular cell is a structural and functional unit of an organism. So we are literally composed of trillions of cells. And so the smallest unit of life is a cell as well. So if we take a bunch of cells that are uh, similar, and we put those together, now we have the tissue level. So a tissue is a group of similar cells that have a common function. So these are smooth muscle cells, so if we take uh, smooth muscle tissue, these cells will, uh, that tissue will contract, that's its function. Above this is an organ. So an organ is a structure composed of two or more tissue types that performs a particular function or specific function. So this is shown the urinary bladder. The urinary bladder stores and houses uh, our urine until we're ready to get rid of it. And it's made of several different tissue types. Now above that is an entire organ system. So an organ system is a, a group of organs that work together to accomplish a common purpose. So here our kidneys are gonna filter and clean our blood. Uh, with that, they're gonna remove excess water, excess salts, and metabolic waste and that's what becomes urine. Urine is then transported from the kidney through the ureter to the urinary bladder, stored there until we have a certain amount, and then we will release that out of our urethra to outside of our body, all right? Now, we take all the organ systems together and we have an organism, and an organism is an individual living thing. So it is the sum total of all these organization levels working together. All right, now let's take a look at the maintenance of life. So the maintenance of life, and first off, we're gonna look at the requirements of life. So the requirements of life, there is actually five requirements of life, and three of these are gonna be intuitively obvious to anybody you ask. So we all need oxygen, air, right? We only can live a couple minutes without that. Uh, we all need water, uh, so we can live a couple days, a few days without water. Uh, we need food, nutrients. We can last, depending on your reserves, a week or two. Uh, with, um, without food. The last two are not as intuitively obvious. One is heat. 
we need heat uh, to undergo the chemical processes that occur in our body. Uh, and then we also need pressure, and pressure is going to move stuff through our body. So, you know, uh, blood pressure, right? Moving blood through our body, osmotic pressure, we'll get to later on. All right. So, all these are necessary for our metabolism. Now, metabolism, what metabolism actually is, is all the chemical reactions that occur within a cell. Now, those chemical reactions require energy, and so that's why energy is strongly tied to our metabolism. All right, so one of the things about those chemical reactions is those chemical reactions require certain things. And so our body has to stay in what we call homeostasis. Homeo means same, stasis means not moving. So homeostasis is a maintenance of internal conditions within certain boundaries. All right. So a good example of this is our body temperature. Our body temperature is 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit or 37 degrees uh, Celsius. And it will fluctuate around there, but it will keep somewhat close to that 98.6. All right. So as I said, we need to stay in homeostasis in order to metabolize. So in order for those chemical reactions to work, we have to have certain requirements for them. Uh, certain temperatures, uh, certain uh, water availability, a certain amount of energy, right? And all those things. So now let's take a look at a, a control of a variable. Okay, so what we have throughout our body are receptors, all right? And so receptors are going to provide information about specific conditions within the internal environment. So for this example, uh, we're going to use um, uh, our body temperature. Right? So we have thermoreceptors found in our skin. They're gonna send signals to our brain about internal conditions. So next, they're gonna send a signal to what is known as our control center. Uh, more often than not, that's our brain, but it can also be our spinal cord. I'll give an example of that after we're done. All right, so uh, our control center determines a set point. A set point is a level or range at which a variable is to be maintained, all right? So, you know, the, like this, this is our set point, 98.6, but you'll see we'll fluctuate around that. All right, so once we send information to our control center, our control center is essentially gonna decide what to do, right? Could be nothing, could be some sort of response. So lastly, it's gonna send a signal out to effectors. So these are organs that cause a response that's gonna alter inter the internal environment, all right? So let's say you go outside on a warm day, that's sensed by your thermoreceptors. They're gonna send a signal up to your brain. Your brain's gonna interpret that and go, oh, it's hot. So it's gonna send a signal back out to our sweat glands and our sweat glands are gonna produce sweat and the sweat's gonna help cool us off, all right? So that's just one example there of uh, controlling of a variable. Now, I do wanna point out that all reflexes are homeostatic mechanisms. So if you step on a tack, right, you will have a withdrawal reflex and you'll pull away from that. Uh, so there, the control center is actually literally in your spinal cord, which is sensing that pain response, and it does an action before you're consciously aware of it. Okay, so let's look at types of control of feedback. So uh, there are two types of control of feedback. One is called a negative feedback mechanism. In a negative feedback mechanism, this is where the output of a system suppresses or inhibits the activity of that system. Okay, so this is just like uh, at your house, you have a thermostat, right? So here, the output of the system is going to inhibit the activity of the system. So once again, so if you're in your house, thermostat set at 75, it gets above 75. Uh, the thermostat's gonna send a signal to your air conditioning unit. Your air conditioning unit turns on and it's gonna pump cold air into your house until your house temperature gets below 75 and then your thermostat shuts off, uh, shuts off the, uh, the air conditioning unit, right? So here, the output of the system, the cold air, will eventually inhibit its own production, uh, which is producing more cold air, right? And so our, uh, mechanisms work the same way. So, you know, if we get hot, we will sweat until we, our body temperature gets back down to normal, and then we stop sweating. Uh, if we get too cold, we're gonna shiver until our body temperature gets back up to normal, and then we stop shivering, all right? So this is how, so negative feedback mechanisms are how most homeostatic interactions are controlled. Another type of control of variable is through positive feedback mechanisms. 
And a positive feedback mechanism is where the output of a system intensifies and increases the activity of that system. All right? So uh, when the system is working, you get more of it. So here is an example. Uh, so I just want to point out, positive feedback mechanisms are rare, but this is one example here in the birthing process. So when the baby's head pushes against the cervix, the cervix is going to, call, uh, is going to dilate, so it's going to open up. That is a signal is sent up to our brain into our uh, uh, pituitary gland, and our pituitary gland secretes oxytocin. Oxytocin causes uterine contractions, and by contracting the uterus, that's going to push the head, uh, baby's head further against the cervix, which causes further cervical dilation, which then causes more oxytocin secretion, which then causes more uh, uterine contractions, which causes more cervical dilation, which causes more oxytocin secretion, which causes more uterine contractions, and this will continue until the baby is pushed out. Now, I do want to point out something here, is that if you've ever witnessed or given birth, it's a much more complex than what I just did here. All right, let's move along to anatomical terminology. So, let's first look at relative positions. So, relative positions. So here what we're talking about is one body part in relationship to another body part. So uh, the first two I'm going to talk about are superior and inferior. So we see superior and inferior here. So superior is where a body part is above another body part, and inferior is where a body part is below another body part. So my head is superior to my chest, my chest is inferior to my head. But here it's all relative, so my, hat, my chest is superior to my waist though, and my waist is inferior to my chest. All right, next is anterior, which we see here, also known as ventral, and posterior, also known as dorsal. All right, so anterior ventral means towards the front, posterior ventral means, uh, sorry, posterior dorsal means towards the back, right? So my breastbone here, my sternum, is anterior to my heart, my heart is posterior to my sternum, all right? But my heart, once again, is anterior to my backbone, my backbone is posterior to my heart. Next is medial and lateral. So here, medial is closer to the midline, lateral is uh, towards the sides or away from the midline. So her arms are lateral to her sternum, uh, her sternum is medial to her arms. Next is proximal and distal. So these are referring to uh, points of attachment. Proximal is closer to the point of attachment, distal is further from the point of attachment. So, so if we look at like our different joints here, right, or so this bone here is the humerus, this is the proximal end, this is the distal end. So here's my elbow, here's my wrist. My wrist is distal to my elbow, it's farther from the point of attachment. My elbow is proximal to my wrist, it's closer to the point of attachment. Next is superficial and deep. Superficial means towards or at the body surface. Uh, deep is away from the body surface. All right, let's look at body sections. So these are cuts that we're gonna see through the human body. Uh, so first is a sagittal section. And so this is a lengthwise cut that divides the body into left and right portions. So that's a cut that would come down like so, right down the middle. And so this is a cut through a cadaver and that's what we see, that sagittal section of the human head there. Next is a transverse or horizontal section. This is a cut that divides the body into superior and inferior portions. So that's a cut you see right there. It would be a cut through this way. So you can see there's a, a horizontal or transverse section there. And lastly is a coronal or frontal section. This is a cut that divides the body into anterior and posterior portions. So that's a cut in this direction here. All right, so you can see this cut right there uh, is a coronal section. So this is what we see through the you know, hip joint there uh, in a coronal section. All right, now next is looking at organ cuts. Uh, organ cuts, so there's um, three different organ cuts. Uh, one is called a cross section. So your book for some reason calls it a transverse section. Um, so it's the only place I've ever seen this. Uh, it's essentially a horizontal cut through the organ. Next is oblique section. You can see that's an angled cut through there, so an angled cut. And then a longitudinal section is a lengthwise cut down, the, down that organ. All right, so last thing we're going to look at is serous membrane, or serosa. And these are membranes that line body cavities and organs. 
Now, anytime uh, an organ you know, moves, so like our heart beats 60 to 100 times a, uh, a minute, and our lungs are gonna inhale and exhale about you know, 12 to 15 times a minute, they're moving against other organs within those cavities. And so what we do is we line all of our body cavities and all of our organs with a membrane called serous membrane. And what that serous membrane does is it produces uh, serous fluid. And serous fluid is a lubricant. So, and that's a fluid that's gonna reduce the friction between the organs and the cavity walls. So when our heart is beating in our chest, there's lubricant all around it, so it's not rubbing up against, uh, with creating a lot of friction between the organs that surround it. All right, now let's look at, looks at types of serosa. So we have two types of serosa. One is called parietal serosa. Parietal serosa is membranes that line cavity walls. And the other is visceral serosa, and those are membranes that are uh, lines of organs. Okay, now these two uh, serosas are continuous with each other. And by being continuous, this creates a cavity between the two. So an analogy is what they're showing here. So if you took your fist and put it into a balloon, the part of the balloon that's next to your fist would be the visceral serosa, and then the part of the balloon out here would be the parietal serosa. And so that creates a cavity between those two membranes, and both those membranes produce serous fluid, so that, you know, if the heart is beating in the chest there, the visceral serosa on the heart is moving against a parietal serosa, and so this is gonna greatly reduce the friction between them. So we have uh, serous membranes around the heart, and around the lungs, and we also have it around all of our internal organs in our abdominal pelvic cavities.